Rupert, it's wonderful to be sitting here with you and having this conversation about, first of all, your new book, Science and Spiritual Practices, Reconnecting Through Direct Experience. And I'd like you to speak on that. And what I believe is so important is that we have been so much in the age of information and data collection. But in this chaotic world we are in right now, when most of us, if we're awake, we're feeling despair and uh, uncertainty, you know, how do we, how do we make a difference in the world? What actually empowers us versus shutting us down? And what I believe we need to do now, instead of collecting more data, is to actually move into direct experience direct experience within ourselves Mm. to those places inside of us where we really do become empowered and for me my entire life and I learned this from the animals is about the spiritual connection Mm. and the spiritual connection to the earth to the animals to the plants to the trees to the sky all of the above reconnecting to that uh, the truth of who we really are, I call it the reawakening. Mm. And you speak of this so beautifully in all the work you have done and with kindred spirits in working with animals. So mm. please, please speak about science and spiritual practices as you would like here. Well, for me, this is an important thing because I'm a scientist and I also have spiritual practices. And for a long time, people thought that spiritual practices and the whole realm of religion and spirituality were somehow opposite to science. Science was about reason and, and, and stuff, and all this was vague and, and subjective and not very important in the real hard world that we live in. Well, it turns out that when you actually look at spiritual practices scientifically, as many people now have done, for example looking at meditation, the effects on the brain, on physiology, on well-being, on health, on preventing depression, and so forth. It turns out that a whole range of traditional spiritual practices have beneficial physiological, mental, and spiritual effects for people, Um, and that these effects can be studied scientifically. And what the science shows is that they are good for you, they promote health, well-being, and effectiveness uh, in the world. Now, within religions, which have all had their own combinations of spiritual practices, um, this has been known forever. Um, But the dismissal of religion and spiritual path by materialistic science had sort of lost all that, and it's now being rediscovered and revalidated in a new way. And I think this is important because it helps overcome the breach or the, the gap that many of us feel as part of our civilization between the scientific and the rational and the subjective and the spiritual. Yes. And actually, uh, when looked at in this way, they're not contradictory, they're complementary. And spiritual experiences are about direct experience of consciousness that comes through consciousness. And science is about experience too. The empirical method means experience, the Greek word uh, empiros, from which we get empirical, um, is about, it means experience and experiment. In French, the same word, experience, means experience and experiment. So there's nothing unscientific about experience. Um, and if we're going to investigate consciousness, we need to do it through consciousness. So, um, so in my book, this I look at seven different spiritual practices, meditation, gratitude, Uh, reconnecting with the more than human world um, uh, relating to plants um, chanting and singing uh, rituals and uh, pilgrimage and these are all found in all different traditions and the one I think that is the particularly important one in your own work is this reconnecting with the more than human world the animals, the plants, the earth and uh, I think that's a vitally important spiritual practice for, um, you know, it works for some people, it works for you, it works for me, it works for David Abram, and it works for a lot of other people. There are some people 
that just doesn't work for us. Some people who just spend their whole life indoors and don't have no particular urge to go outdoors. And other practices may work better for them. So it's not either or. It's that whatever suits particular people well. I mean, you have a really strong link to animals, and I do too, and to plants. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I think the importance of these is that if spiritual practices give us a, a sense of connection to a reality, a conscious reality greater than ourselves. That's how I define the effect of spiritual practices, that they connect us to something bigger than ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Whereas egoistic practices, like sort of wanting to get ahead, wanting to get rich, wanting to acquire power, influence, and it's all about me. Yes. These things are all about going beyond me, so it's about us and about... Right our connection with the right. greater whole. Right, right. And I think a lot of people are feeling a futility and frustration with having followed that path of, well, if I make enough money, if I uh, ha earn enough degrees, blah, 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 I will find happiness. But that is a, a transient moment. And then there's that feeling of, oh, that's not it. So that combined with that not enoughness seeking seeking some sort of happiness and joy from what is only transient we're still left with the dilemma combined with environmental devastation mm. political turmoil all these things we're faced with and people are feeling a bit numb frankly but i find in my work that something as simple as a pilgrimage just in the garden Mm. You know, or um, sitting in quiet, taking a day of silence inside with my dog. Mm. Uh, offer us the garden, the the companion animal, the watching a deer in the wild, pulls us, seduces us into a place that mm. offers a connection mm. with what is beyond. Yes, and and that is where we can. Remember that there is more going on. We can connect with it. It's, it. it is our. It's the truth of who we are. Exactly, and I think we we are connected to something greater than ourselves. All religions and all spiritual traditions tell us that our own consciousness or minds are part yes. of something greater than right, ourselves. Right. Now, if we take the kind of materialist atheist view that our minds are nothing but our brains, we're all separate, just inside our heads, mm -hmm. and disconnected from each other, living in a purposeless universe. That's very disempowering and depressing. It's not surprising that millions of people are actually clinically depressed. We, live and on in, medication. Uh, we have a world yeah. view that actually encourages depression. Um, so I think when there's re recovering the sense of connection um, is empowering individually because it makes us feel that we're not just alone and we're not just isolated individuals. And despair is literally lack of hope, désespoir in yes. French. And um, the, if we're connected with something bigger than ourselves and we see that there's underlying the evolution of the universe and the evolution of life and the evolution of humanity, mm -hmm. there's been some greater purpose, something's been going on and it's a long-term process and we're part of it. Um, then it gives us a greater sense of hope of things yes. moving in the right direction. If we think that we're isolated, um, we're surrounded by inexorable economic and political forces which are destructive in their influence and we're all isolated individuals, powerless in the face of all this, then that is literally disempowering. Um, so I think recovering the sense of connection, recovering the sense that we're part of something bigger than ourselves and part of a process bigger than ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that what, what's going on in the world is an evolutionary process that could have good outcomes, not just bad outcomes. Absolutely, and what's so so critical right now is that what you're offering and um, much of the work I do, it isn't just theory, it isn't just collecting more data, it's actually having a personal experience. Because exactly. we, we cannot transform without experience. No, experience is the key. It's and the key. The point about spiritual practices is that what they all do is help us to have experiences. The point of the practices exactly. is experience. Right, right. And um, in my book, at the end of each chapter, I suggest two very simple things people can do 
to um, actually have these experiences. I mean, for example, reconnecting with nature, finding a sit spot, a place where you sit outdoors every day for about 20 minutes and just quietly listening and observing what happens around you. And by the time you've been quietly for about 10 minutes, the animals get used to you being there and settle down and yeah. go about their business normally instead of being alarmed at your presence. And that gives a very great sense, a very, very simple way of re-establishing a connection. As you said, just being quiet. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And allowing. And, and allowing. Yes, instead of out there trying, I've got to do, I've got to do, da 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 da, -da. Yes, it's that's why I find sitting allowing. quietly, I, I, it works for me better near where I live in London is Hampstead Heath. And it works for me better when I go to a spot I like very much on Hampstead Heath and in my mm -hmm. own garden. Because mm -hmm. in my own garden, as soon as I sit there quietly, I notice weeds that I ought to be pulling out or uh -huh. things I ought to be doing. So it works better. Uh, out, I mean, my garden is a beautiful place, but right. it, in, it, it may, for other people who don't actually feel they have to weed it, it may be more <laughs> peaceful than it is for me. Right. Um, but another one is, is just giving thanks, being grateful. And there's now a lot of research that shows that people who are grateful for what they have instead of thinking about what they don't have or what they're angry about, are happier, healthier, and more liked by other people. Mm -hmm. And gratitude is something which one can do as a practice, and people who make a practice every day, or at least every week, thinking of the things for which they're grateful, um, are measurably happier than people who don't. Mm -hmm. And one of the very simple practices I suggest is just a few a brief pause before meals either saying a grace yes. or sitting yes. holding hands with other people silently or singing a grace um, yes. a very traditional way of expressing gratitude and bringing people together before eating yes. and bringing people into a sac the sacredness of that meal and bringing our attention to the plants the if you eat meat the animals those who gave their life so that yes. you can live and to in humble gratitude well exactly I mean you can with gratitude you can there's no limit to how far you can go yes. at the very least one can be grateful for the people who've cooked the meal and who've grown the food and then yep. to the earth that's enabled all this to happen and the climate right. and and then to the whole solar system without which there would be no earth and then to the whole galaxy without which there'd be no solar system, then to the whole universe, and then to that consciousness from which all things come forth. That's I mean, right. and for people who don't believe in God or any consciousness, then uh, 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 there's um, no reason not to be grateful to the Earth and the solar system. I mean, you can go as That's far. Right. There's a long yes. way you can go even if you don't right. believe in God. Yes, even if you don't believe in God, you can believe in the beauty and the... Uh, this beautiful earth that is providing life, the air we breathe, yes. right? That uh, the, the incredible, amazing understanding that we breathe out the carbon dioxide that the plants breathe in and then return oxygen to us. I mean, there's a magic and mystery to that. Uh, exactly. And so I think that the, you know, just through this simple act of giving thanks before meals, all these bigger things come into the right, picture. Right. And sometimes it's only a fairly brief period, so there isn't time for all these longer reflections. But um, ideally, in, in the, this pause before eating, to just opening up to this gratitude and acknowledgement, is such a simple thing. It costs absolutely nothing, and it just changes the way one relates to one's food and one's existence and one's life here on Earth. Yes, and I would just like to say that all the incredible work you've done with animals and uh, the natural world we're so grateful for and I know for me if I want to uh, check in with the uh, spiritual world I look into the eyes of my little dog and I start there well I think this is one of the great teachings you have Linda because a lot of people feel this about animals but they can't articulate it and um, I mean after all more than 50% of American households keep pets of one yes. kind or another. Right. They don't have to. It's in many cases we expensive, do. and it can be a nuisance. Um, 
but they're doing it because they feel the need for that connection with animals, with right. non-human animals. Right, right. And it's very deep in our nature. We grew up as hunter-gatherers living in outdoors amidst animals and plants. And um, this animal connection is, I think, essential to our humanity. Yes, and as we know, anima, animal, anima, means soul. And yes. we are connected. I know animals were my introduction to a spiritual awareness when I was a little girl. So I'm very grateful for that. But you see, the official scientific world view says that animals are machines, <laughs> and therefore it's perfectly fine to grow them in factory farms. Yes. Because factory farms are just an efficient me means of producing meat, uh, which is a retail product. I mean, it's, it, the attitude to animals... Actually, most people in our culture have a split attitude to animals. They think one way about their pets, which they love and care for. Thank you for saying that, yes. And then another... And, and just don't think at all about the battery chickens that give rise to the supermarket chickens that they buy, or the chicken products, or, yes. or the beef yeah. that's in the hamburger, or, right, right. or the pork, or the yeah. pigs that yeah. factory intensively farmed pigs and right. pork. So I'm, I myself, I rarely eat meat. I eat it sometimes, but when I do... Um, I try and eat meat that's, uh, from animals that have grown outdoors. Yes. In a, uh, yes. The only domestic animal that's always grown outdoors is, is, is sheep. Uh, they haven't found a way of factory farming sheep yet. Don't give anyone ideas. <laughs> 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 but I thank you, thank you for saying that because sometimes people will say to me, well, what is one thing? Can I do one thing to help? And I say, if there's only one thing... The, the most important one thing you could do would be to stop eating uh, red meat in particular. You know, yes. Stop eating meat. Well, factory farmed meat, I think. I mean, as I it's say, I think if people are going to shocking. eat meat, then eating mutton or lamb is better than eating beef or pork. Right. Unless it's organically grown and right. outdoor and grass-fed right. and all that. Right, yes. So I think there are, uh, there, there are quite a few things people can do, actually, but being more grateful before meals, avoiding factory farmed meat um, and relating to plants you have a chapter in a your whole book, chapter on plants a whole chapter on plants um, in your new book and we will talk more about this and many other things um, and more about our connection with animals uh, thank you Rupert so so very much well thank you Linda to be continued yes to be continued <laughs>